CD まで楽しめるんですロング氏が持ち帰った感動と興奮をパイオニアはそのまま再現未体験と遊ぶそれが This is a 3D shooting game with high speed, high quality computer graphics. You get a level of virtual reality that has never been available through those conventional home video game machines. In the previous installment of Wonders of the Retro Gaming World, I explored the TurboGrafx CD and CD-ROM2 attachments for the TurboGrafx-16 and PC Engine, which were the very first home gaming devices to use CD-ROMs. In my whimsical travels around the World Wide Web in order to research these goods, I stumbled upon the Laser Active. These are related because the Laser Active was referred to as a converged media device, and an early one at that. The main base of the console was manufactured by Pioneer and could play laser discs as well as a few CD formats. However, it had partnerships with Sega and NEC that also enabled TurboGrafx-16 and Genesis games to be played through it. Assuming, of course, you purchased the correct additional modules. Other examples of converged game consoles include the 3DO, Philips CDI, Commodore CD-TV, and even the Tandy Video Information System. But the sheer oddness of the Laser Active stood out to me because it brought NEC and Sega into the same console in 1993. So, without a doubt, it is indeed a wonder of the retro gaming world. Although Europe missed out entirely, the Laser Active was released in Japan on the 30th of August 1993, and then in the States on the 13th of September. The beginning of a press release at launch sums up things nicely. Marking its entry into the multimedia and video game arena, Pioneer Electronics Incorporated announces the retail launch of Laser Active, the industry's first multi-platform system to combine high-quality full-motion video, digital sound, and interactive capabilities. More than a sophisticated alternative to CD-ROM-based systems, Laser Active utilizes superior quality analog video that is the hallmark of the LaserDisc format, and a high-density data storage capacity to provide consumers with the most advanced and versatile interactive interactive entertainment system on the market today. Before we go any further, I should quickly mention the LaserDisc format if you're not already in the know. Developed in partnership with Philips, MCA, and of course Pioneer, the LaserDisc format actually predated the CD since it was released in 1978. Used for home video, it presented superior analog video and sound compared to its then rivals, VHS and Betamax. However, it was hampered by its high price point and never really took off in the West until the 1990s, where it was then trumped by the DVD. While the LaserDisc is still relatively known about, the fact that the Laser Active used it as its primary source of content definitely adds to the obscureness. The base unit of the Laser Active included two disc trays. The bigger of the two played LaserDisc videos and games, while the smaller one was compatible with CDs and CDVs. If you're wondering what a CDV is, it stands for CD Video, not to be confused with the far more common Video CD or VCD for short. The CDV was a short-lived format that was introduced in 1987 that was capable of playing 20 minutes of digital audio which could be played in a regular old CD player but also approximately 5 minutes of analog video on compatible players like the Laser Active. An example of a use for the CDV would be a short music album that includes a single music video. It failed for reasons that I'm sure are obvious, but if you want to know more, I highly recommend an excellent video by Techmoan, which I've linked in the description. Regardless, it's interesting that Pioneer chose to include compatibility. The Laser Active on its lonesome is incapable of playing games, however, so this is where its modular attachments, called packs, come into play. Sold separately, we'll start with the LD-ROM2 pack by NEC. The module includes a slot for TurboGrafx-16 Hue card games, as well as a single controller port for the special edition Laser Active Turbo Pad it came bundled with. Once the pack is installed though, you can then also play CD-ROM2 and Super CD-ROM games in the Laser Active CD tray, as well as a proprietary format just for the Laser Active, which was called the LD-ROM2 Disc. Those were released on 8 and 12 inch laser discs, and of course, played in the bigger tray. The pack came with a game called a Connoisseurus on LD-ROM2, as well as a compilation CD of T16 games, which included Gates of Thunder, Bonk's Revenge, Bonk's Adventure, and Bomberman. It should be noted that the American version of this pack is considered to be quite rare because of the T16's poor performance in the West. However, the Japanese version is far more common, and fortunately, also region free. 
The other half of the games were playable using the Mega LD pack, which included a cartridge slot for Genesis games, as well as two controller ports. Just like the LD-ROM 2, it also came bundled with a special edition controller. Once the pack was installed, Sega CD games could be played in the CD tray, while another separate proprietary format for the Laser Active, the Mega LD Disc, again utilised 8 and 12 inch laser discs. Sadly though, the 32X is not supported. But then again, that was not to see the light of day for another 12 months, so I'd hazard a guess that's the reason why. The Mega LD also came with games. This time around it was Pyramid Patrol on the Mega LD format, as well as a compilation CD that included Revenge of Shinobi, Golden Axe, Streets of Rage, and Columns. It should be noted that if either the LD-ROM2 or Mega LD packs are installed, the Laser Active will be able to read the CD plus G format. The G stands for Graphics, and this additional obscure 80s disc format is capable of showing low-res graphics as audio plays. Now, this format was mostly used in karaoke machines, but that wasn't very useful here since neither pack included microphone inputs. Luckily, the Laser Active had just the pack for that. The karaoke pack, as it was so called, enabled the Laser Active to play 200 Laser Karaoke titles. As you can imagine, this format was on Laserdisc. This pack included two microphone inputs as well as a bunch of audio controls. There are volume knobs for each mic input, plus other buttons that control aspects of audio such as tone and echo. The fourth and final module, the Computer Interface Pack, is a bit trickier to find information on. It's not even mentioned in that initial press release or western advertisements, leading me to speculate that it was only ever released in Japan. It includes an RS-232 serial port that allows it to interface with a computer, essentially permitting the laser active to be programmed by software. So, why would you want to do this? Well, this answer took me quite a while to develop, but after a bit of research, I discovered that there are commercial Laserdisc players out there that also include a serial port. These are used to perform functions, such as adding overlays to videos for activities like karaoke, or arcade games like Dragon's Lair. Things like that. Think multimedia setups. This theory was proved when I came across a Japanese brochure for the Laser Active, which had a section on this pack. Using Google Translate, which performed admirably by the way, it said this. The computer interface pack is attached to the Laser Active and connected to a personal computer so that you can freely control your Laserdisc or CD from your computer and transform it into original interactive software. Examples include editing a Laserdisc movie as you like, turning karaoke into quizware, and more. It depends on your idea. How nice. It came with software on floppy disk called the Laser Active Program Editor, which was compatible with DOS and Mac OS. While there were no more packs released, there are a few more side notes worth mentioning. For one, there were 3D goggles. These were actually compatible with the Sega Master System, believe it or not. Two goggles could be attached to the Laser Active at once using an adapter as well. However, only four LD-ROM2 games were ever compatible, ensuring that this was quite the underused accessory. The second thing I wanted to mention was that, interestingly, NEC actually released a clone of the Laser Active, which was called the LD-ROM2 system, in the December of 1993. This was exactly the same price as the Laser Active and accepted all the packs and accessories. I can't find any solid information as to why this was a thing, but I'd guess it was part of the licensing agreement between Pioneer and NEC. The Laser Active was a console though, so let's talk about the games. With all packs at your disposal, your Laser Active could play approximately 1500 games across all the different formats. But for the sake of this video, your bandwidth and my sanity, let's just focus on the games encoded on Laserdisc. While it was hard to find a specific figure, it appears that something like 9 games were released on NEC's LD-ROM2, while about 20 are out there for the Mega LD. These are relegated, for the most part, to 3 different types of games. Point and shoot games which were mostly 16-bit graphics overlaid onto FMV like the before mentioned Pyramid Patrol. Point and click adventure games like Manhattan Requiem which were again graphics overlaying FMV. And finally educational games like Quizaconosaurus which were mostly made up of menus and illustrations. There was also softcore porn which was ever so casually mentioned in that initial press release. But this is YouTube so 90s naked ladies aren't allowed. You'll have to source information about that elsewhere. Regardless, are you seeing a pattern? These were not defining games of the fourth generation. While FMV was cool for about 10 minutes, it was quickly surpassed by real-time 3D environments universally only a year later on newer consoles. 
On a technical level, these laser discs were capable of holding 60 minutes of video and audio each side, as well as 540 megabytes of data. These games were more or less interactive menus, and presumably didn't require much to run. I wish I could tell you the specs the laser active was rocking, but that information simply doesn't seem to exist on the internet. If you happen to know, or at least have a good hunch, then please let me know in the comments. Some may argue that the world of advances in consumer technology is moving too quickly. Others wonder if what they own today can be used tomorrow. Knowing that, Pioneer has developed the Laser Active Player, technology that allows you to enjoy everything you already know and have come to appreciate in laser disc quality, and now gives you the chance to experience the interactive future of games, learning systems, music, theater, and movies, all with a single touch. Are you starting to see holes, my dear viewer? You're probably starting to ask questions like, why haven't I heard of this beast, and why haven't I seen one at Goodwill? Well, the answer to that is that the Laser Active was a fair bit of a failure. There were several reasons for this, but the grandest by no contest was the cost. The base unit alone, which didn't include any packs by the way, was $970 US, or 89,800 yen in 1993 money. That, adjusted for inflation, as of recording this video in 2018, is nearly $1,700. Wow. The NEC and Sega packs were originally $600 each as well, which converts to just over $1,000 now. While the karaoke pack was relatively cheap at $350, that's still the equivalent of $600. This thing was not cheap. In comparison, a Genesis by itself cost $230 at the time, while a Sega CD was $90. To many people, unless they had no respect for their money, this thing made no financial sense. To buy everything together, not including the computer interface pack, costs a staggering $2,520, which equates to $4,352 now. The Laser Active was the second most expensive console ever, supposedly second only to the RDI Halcon, but that's a story for another day. I mean sure, you might want those Sega and NEC Laserdisc games which were exclusive to the system, but those were an additional $120, which now translates to over $200 each. And even then, like I mentioned before, were nothing special in the slightest, let alone grossly overpriced. Unsurprisingly, both NEC and Sega neglected to support these formats after the demise of the Laser Active, and who can blame them? Those two different Laserdisc formats are another good point of discussion also. Why would Pioneer choose to split a user base between two formats on the same console? Ultimately, Sega's Mega LD outperformed the LD-ROM 2, but it didn't matter. These things were quickly obsolete. Consoles like the PlayStation were just around the corner, with all the joys they were capable of. Games weren't the Laser Active's only issue though. For one, it suffered from very poor marketing. At CES 1993 for instance, Pioneer opted to only show the Laser Active behind closed doors, which allowed the 3DO, which was a very similar console in some ways, to shine and stand out at the show. Even after the fact, Pioneer put very little effort into promoting the machine. Looking aside from the fact that it was huge and weighed over 11 kilos, it just wasn't a very good Laser Disc player. It lacked more premium features that dedicated players of the time had, like a jog dial, digital display, Dolby digital support, and automatic side changing. Considering the sheer cost of the thing, excluding these features made it all the more difficult to recommend at that price point. While it did eventually see some price drops from at least the May of 1994 onwards, it never made any inroads to the console gaming market. After only 10,000 units sold, it was very quietly discontinued in 1996. I don't have a specific date for this, let alone a month, but I've read anecdotal information that suggests it was during the Easter of that year. If you're interested in buying a unit today, you should know that these fetch a price very similar to that of the 90s. You'd have to hate your money as much as anyone who bought one brand new. Most games will set you back over $100 too, unless you want the 90s naked ladies. Be prepared to pay a lot more for those. And sadly, emulation is not really an option. While there is an emulator called Daphne, there's more geared towards Laserdisc arcade games, being far from Laser Active specific. Pioneer is celebrating its 80th anniversary this year, and guess how many gaming devices they made before or after the Laser Active? If you answered zilch, then congratulations, you would be correct. I think it's safe to assume that this project scared them away from gaming permanently. 
Sure, the Laser Active was an interesting idea to congregate some of the biggest media formats of the time into one easy to use, albeit huge device. It was just too bad that it was so damn pricey. It was relegated to those with more money than what they knew to do with. After all, it wasn't really that awful to have a separate Genesis, TurboGrafx-16 and a LaserDisc player under the One TV for a much lower price. It had no place in the gaming industry, but it was one of the biggest oddities of the 90s and for that reason alone, I have a lot of respect for it. A two thumb salute to you, Laser Active. Hello Retro Gamers and thanks for watching. Links to sources and videos can be found in the description box. Catch you next time.